my birth records were open as I was born before 1964. When I found out that they were closed for anyone born after that, I, I couldn't even believe it. It just, it just seemed unfathomable to me that people couldn't have access to that basic information about where they came from. My name is William B. Norris. I am an adoptive father and an attorney at law. When I adopted my first child in 1957, I discovered that the general public had unlimited access to the vital statistics records of adopted children. My dad pulled me aside and said, I've got a big confession to make. I had a hand in closing the records. The present closed records law was due in large part to my efforts back in the early 1960s. Of course, I was shocked. <laughs> and I'd been working on adoption legislation three years before he told me he did what he did. Frankly, I was unable to see the impact this would have on my own adopted children when they became adults. I now recognize that closing those birth records to adoptees was a grave mistake. Yeah, it was, it was like a Greek tragedy, you know, you know the, son, the son or daughter unknowingly trying to unwittingly undo the sin of the parent. <laughs> so, yeah. This is the house that I grew up in, and uh, white picket fence and everything. My mom and I in our backyard, the summer that I was placed. Saddle shoes, look at that. <laughs> I think that's a cute picture of my dad when we were little. He looks like he's a great dad. He was, yeah. They told me that I was adopted before I even knew what it meant. I learned that concept along with, you know, others as I was growing up. They were always very open to talk about it, and they would have shared anything that they knew. They just, they had no information about my background, even nationality or how old my birth parents had been, any kind of medical history, nothing. I always wanted to look, um, but I never knew that you could. Uh, when I was in, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and you never heard about it. I thought that it would be a big intrusion to my birth parents. I thought people would misunderstand and think that my adoptive parents hadn't done a good job, and um, I, I was intimidated to even call the agency to get information. And I never really knew that people did look or could look until I was in a bookstore one day and I saw the adoption triangle and it, it leapt off the shelf at me and I gobbled it up. I read it all, you know, straight through overnight. And it was such an eye-opener. It really made me realize maybe this was a gaping hole for my birth mother as well. And um, we could both go through, through our lives wanting to know and nobody taking the first step because we were both too chicken. I, you know, I was desperate for any information. I'd been searching for six months before I even knew I could get my birth certificate, so I just assumed they were closed. Um, but I am pre-64. I had what I needed to get my birth certificate. Um, I can't even put into words the feeling that I had when I received the envelope that had a copy of my original birth certificate. There it was, and it was so validating. It was like my alter ego. <laughs> it was this whole other part of me that I was just discovering at age 25. The first name I saw in the birth certificate was Victoria Faith Boyer. And I thought, oh, my birth mother had such a beautiful name. And it turned out that's what she had named me. Um, so that was, that was quite a message and gave me a lot of optimism and hope during the time of my search. So how come that piece of paper is so important? Um, it's identity, it's grounding, it's you know something that pertains only to me and my history. Um, it's irreplaceable. So this is my birth family at the time that I found them. The two of these are identical twins. They were 16 and he was 18. The three of us together, like shortly after I found them. Oh, that's your birth mother? My birth mother, my birth father, and me. So they married? Mm-hmm. They did? Yeah. I didn't know that. You didn't know that? Oh, yeah. yeah. They got married 18 months after I was born, so those are my full siblings. It, the ironies of life, my adopted parents were divorced, my birth parents are still married. Very shortly after my reunion, I was really taken by this whole issue of the records, that the records were open to me that were so important to my identity. But adoptees just a few years younger than me in Ohio didn't have the same access to that information about themselves. This is the article that actually got everything started, this Plain Dealer reporter, and she wanted to do a story about my reunion. So I told her, you can do a story about my reunion, but only if you do a story about the records being closed. <laughs> And, uh, and our efforts to want to try to get those opened. So that was the very first article 
ever, myself and my birth parents. The first bill in Ohio was 1989, and it sailed through the House and then got slammed in the Senate. It's funny how naive we were. We, uh, the very first conference that we hosted, we went and interviewed with the reporter, and at the end of the interview, she asked us what phone number people could use to contact us for more information. So I just said, well, you can put my number in. <laughs> and I got literally 275 phone calls over a three-day period when this um, news article was in. You know, I was just propelled forward, you know, kind of swept up in it after that. Yeah, so this was the very first bill. So we tried very hard to publish as many facts as we could find. Um, and being the late 80s, there wasn't, you know, there was a lot, more, there was a much bigger volume of information than facts that people have gathered now than there was available then. Um, opposition testimony from 1990. What was the opposition back then? Dr. Wilkie of Ohio Right to Life, um, a probate court judge, and Bill Pierce from National Council for Adoption. They had a birth mother testifying with, um, just by the name Eve, you know, so somewhat anonymously testifying. And I was sitting behind her and could see that somebody had typed up testimony for her with fill in the blank, you know, hello, my name is blank. You know, so she obviously hadn't written it herself. And it was so disheartening to have these myths propagated in a way that just you know, it sounded so easy to believe, like, oh, we're hearing from a birth mother. So people have a lot of misunderstandings, and uh, people have made up all these stories about birth parents and what they wanted or what their motives would be to place a child or how they might feel about that child that they're placing and how they might feel after. And uh, all these years, I've never had a birth parent call and ask us to support keeping the records closed. As much as we brought many, 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 many birth parents to come forward and tell the true stories, people continued to feel like, well, there's all those birth parents that won't come in and talk to us because they're hiding behind the tree and want that secrecy. Um, and uh, the things that people would get up and say, it was hard to stomach. It was very emotional the first, you know, it still is, but especially the first several attempts, you know, I'd leave just devastated. Well, at first I was fighting for it because of the power my birth certificate held for me. Um, so that other people would be able to experience that. There was um, no reason in my mind that somebody should be blocked that type of personal information about themselves. When my dad came and told me his story, um, that, that uh, cemented it, you know. He, he had always completely supported me in my reunion. He was really helpful, and he wanted to meet my birth parents when I found them. And he actually didn't tell me about the records piece until this conference that we were having in 91 when he came and pulled me aside and said, I've got a big confession to make. He, you know, attended the whole thing, went to all the workshops, and then went home that night and went into his boxes of storage of old archives and pulled out stuff that he had done on the legislation because I think enough was gnawing at him at that point that he went and uncovered it and found out, lo and behold, it was. And he came the Sunday morning of the conference and said, I've got to talk to you. And we went in one of the workshop rooms and sat in the chairs. And he said, I went home and did some research and realized that I had a hand in closing the records. And he had you know, obviously known throughout my search that he had this legislative involvement, but he didn't know it, in fact, had the full effect of closing the records to the adoptees. His purpose was to close the records from the public. Um, after they'd adopted my brother in the late 50s, he'd asked for my brother's birth certificate, and he was um, just handed uh, the two birth certificates he amended in the original paper clip together. In fact, they were open to the public. They'd never even asked who he was, why he needed them. And uh, so as a new adoptive parent, he found that alarming. He had babies at home, and he had been told by the agency, the records are closed, nobody can find out, the birth parents will never have any information about you. In his mind, you know, he didn't understand birth parents and what their their situation would have been. And uh, so he was scared of them. So it was out of fear. Um, so without really thinking about an adult adoptee's need, he got together some other young adoptive parents who were attorneys, and together they drafted a bill that um, ultimately passed in 1963 that closed the records in 1964. My dad and I were very close, luckily, um, and I... He's always had uh, the highest standard of integrity, and so I was disappointed and shocked, um, but I also saw the power in maybe him coming to, to help us open them, because he obviously 
thought that it went too far and he was apologetic about his role. Um, January of 94, he did come down actually through a major snowstorm in uh, northern Michigan to testify to the Ohio legislature to tell them his story, that he had done this, it had been wrong, it had gone too far. This is not what they had meant to do. I am testifying in support of access to birth certificates for Ohio adoptees. I, I have to give him a lot of credit. You know, he was a big enough person to uh, come back and say, you know, I was wrong. I made a huge mistake and we need to change this. And We must be honest in recognizing that the 1964 law was created mostly out of concerns felt by adoptive parents. The resulting secrecy has not benefited, rather it has hurt the most innocent parties in the process, the adoptees. Adoption is more than simply a process, it is life itself. And the well-meaning actions that gave rise to the 1964 law have had a cruel result. You know, again, I being naive, I thought, well, that's, you know, what more could you have? The person who made this happen is coming back to change it. And so, of course, the legislators are going to say, okay, this was a well-meaning mistake and change the law, but it, it still didn't pass. You know, he was always a community activist. That's one of the places that I got a foresight to speak out and be public about issues that I care about. But I was naive when I started all this. I had no idea the uphill battle that this was going to be. I mean, I, I thought these bills are going to pass. This is the right thing. Um, people are going to understand this. And I had no idea what I was facing politically. We worked on this for two and a half decades. There was, there was a lot to overcome. Seven, seven different bills in that time. I think a lot of people thought that the bill passed back then because there was so much media about it and it seemed like a no-brainer. But it was very hard to convince people, hey, we're all adults and you know, we can manage our lives. We don't need the state to be managing our lives. These aren't even all the boxes. This is media and photographs just over the years. You know, we got an extraordinary amount of media. Lots of articles, different feature stories. Um, this notebook itself is just one year of media and one of the bills. You know, it goes on and on and on. And all the media is pretty positive. So uh, it was amazing. You know, again, I was naive and I kept thinking, oh, these, these bills are going to pass. We have all this support. <laughs> We worked on this bill over and over, you know, like the movie Groundhog Day, you know, just reliving it over and over again. Right after our 96 bill, the floodgates opened with Tennessee and with Oregon being the first. It was hard to watch other states uh, in pretty quick order do everything that we were trying to do. This is so much more than a piece of paper. These are the little tapes that I kept the hearings on. Like I might have Wilkie and um, Bill Pierce and different people. I've got boxes of opposition testimony. I have more boxes in my office from all of the um, testimony and the bills themselves. And what, what year did your dad pass away? 2006. It was really hard. He, he was a very healthy, vibrant 80 years old, a very young 80. Um, and he was diagnosed with cancer and passed away within three months. And, and then after my dad died, I found out something that I wish he knew. I was going through his belongings at his house, looking for the file from his legislative efforts in the 60s. I found a very long letter, probably 15 pages long, that helped um, in the drafting of the bill. And um, about halfway through on page 7, much to my surprise, he had taken a very strong stand that the adult adoptee should have access to their birth certificate as an adult. He says in the letter, it's my conviction that the adopting parents should have an absolute right to inspect and copy this original birth certificate. It is also my conviction that the adopted child should have a similar right, although I would not grant this right to the adopted child until he's 21 years of age. So that's clearly, he says it more than once. That's clearly what he believed. I wish that my dad and I had been able to go over these materials. I'm not sure when he went back to look at what he had done that he realized that he was fighting for adoptee access all along. We also ran across a very interesting interview with one of the legislators who was one of the sponsors of the bill. The man who sealed the records in 1964 is Edward C. Schumacher, who served as state representative for Hamilton County, 1960 through 64. My law closes the book on background, he says, which is the way it should be handled. I close the book because knowing isn't going to change a thing. This law gives the child an opportunity to start someplace as if that were the day he was born. It's better for society and for the child if he doesn't know he's adopted. 
Representative Edward Schumacher, House Bill 202, 1963. In a lot of ways, it's good to go back and to see what, what really did happen because um, it's, it's gotten so distorted of people thinking that the birth parents asked for the records to be closed. It was not anything to do with the birth parents. The birth parents absolutely did not ask for the records to be sealed. There's no evidence at all that they were even at the table or asked their opinion. It was very clear it was the adoptive parents and the legislators that um, pushed their agenda. I would tell my dad now that he shouldn't blame himself, um, that it really wasn't his fault, that it was something that, yes, he started, but it was much bigger than him. And a lot of people who I don't think knew very much about adoption inserted their agendas and their values and beliefs. Did you and your dad ever think this would take so long? No, you know, it's 20 years since he testified. And um, no, I don't think either of us thought it would possibly take that long. So talk about what happened in uh, 2013. Um, right to Life came on board to support the bill. Catholic Conference came on board to support the bill. We had the momentum that it was it was really now or never to get that bill through. Um, this is Dorothy Polanda. She was our sponsor in the House. Totally, totally into it. And was a wonderful sponsor, wonderful champion. Senator Beagle was amazing. There's no way we could have gotten this done without him. Senator Beagle really felt the sense of urgency that it had to happen now. The moment that I remember most um, vividly is when it first went to the House of Representatives in the spring. It was right in the middle of the American Adoption Congress conference here in Cleveland. So I was torn, should I be in Columbus, should I be in Cleveland? And in the end, we streamed it live in the hallway at the American Adoption Congress. House Bill number 61 regarding access to adoption records. Chair recognizes Representative Palan. I rise today to talk to you about House Bill 61. Watching the people testify and watching the response and having no opposition come forward. I never thought that would happen. Um, I want to thank Betsy Norris. She brought this legislation to us. The question is, shall the bill pass? The House will prepare and proceed to vote. Watching all the names turn green on the, on the board when they voted it was such a moment of elation. It passed almost unanimously. 96 affirmative votes, one negative vote. Having received the required constitutional majority, the bill was therefore passed and entitled. You know, I was on cloud nine. I was elated and then, uh, you know, very quickly realized, like, oh, my God, my dad's not here, you know, to watch this. And um, so it was, it was a real jumble of emotions. The bill signing was an incredible experience. Governor Kasich spent probably 20 minutes speaking with us and questions, engaging us in discussion. This is our lobbyist, Aaron. Great pictures with our three really dedicated sponsors. Nikki wasn't able to come to the signing, but uh, this is Dave Burke, who's an adoptee himself. He'll get his own birth certificate as a result of this bill. Uh, this is Mike from Ohio Right to Life. Um, Kate Livingston, who's a birth mom with Ohio Birth Parent Group, who did a lot of work on this bill. It was an incredible day. I told the governor I'd been working on this for over two decades. After he was all done and we were finished, we were filing out of the room, and he grabbed one of the last people to leave, and he said, where's that woman that worked on this for decades? And he ran out um, and grabbed me and gave me this big hug and said, you know, we should have passed this bill 20 years ago. And uh, I had a picture of my dad in my pocket um, during the signing, and you know, so it was, it was bittersweet. It's like, yeah, we should have done this 20 years ago. <laughs> we sure should have. How do you think your dad would feel about how long you um, stuck with this? I know he was really proud of me and everything that I put into this. And um, he, you know, he, he really respected that and um, wanted me to persevere and to keep going. And, you know, I think he knew that, that we were on the right side of it and that someday it would pass. I tell you, I'm, I'm extremely proud of this young woman. Perhaps with House Bill 487, we can bring Ohio back into the sunshine where it was before 1964. I didn't truly believe that it would not happen. I really thought this isn't going to happen. And I, I believe firmly that if Betsy hadn't been involved, it wouldn't have happened. Just very careful work by uh, Betsy and under her leadership over the years made the difference. Time and again it would get defeated. She wouldn't let it stop her. She'd get right back up and start it again. 
I just knew Betsy was pushing forward and I thought it was going to happen and it did. When I would get phone calls from people that were in search, adoptees, birth parents, I just knew how important this was to them because they really had a right to know and a need to know and I knew Betsy wasn't going to give up on that. I couldn't believe that it had to be fought for. I thought it was just a given that that information should be made available. There's no secrecy and, and you know, and, and it just has changed how, how the whole thing is done and it's pretty cool to be part of it. And nothing horrible happened when the birth family and the adoptive family communicate and know each other and it's open. It's been really eye-opening to me coming in here and, and seeing all the work that goes into this. When I saw it pass, I was like, you go, Betsy. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of stood back and watched Betsy get the news and just be so elated. It really sticks out in my mind when it passed. It was Betsy's dad. I, I just know how much he wanted to see it change. I was at one meeting when Brad was there when he acknowledged that he had made a mistake with the original bill. Mm -hmm. And to watch him admit that to Betsy was very powerful. That story is almost mythic. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> one of our volunteers came up with the slogan, Roar, Restore Ohio Adoptee Rights. Um, and so we made the logo Roar in 2013. And then it looked like, oh my God, <laughs> this isn't going to happen in 2013. Um, but, you know, then in the end it did. So if somebody had said back in 1988, it'll be 2013, you'll finally do this. <laughs> I tell people when I started the network, I was young and naive and energetic, and it's a really good thing. <laughs> Some people have always said Betsy's like the dog with the bone, you know, she won't let it go. And, you know, if you really fight hard and long enough for something, you know, um, it can happen. March 20th, 2015 will be opening day here in Ohio.